Welcome everyone to our second episode of Places People Purpose, which features the Republic of Panama. Panama is a place that my sister, mom, and I love. Although small in size relative to many countries in the world, Panama has impacts that extend way beyond its borders. And today's podcast will focus on information about Panama that a lot of people are not aware of. We did not know the full history of Panama until my sister and I visited the amazing Bio Museum in Panama City. If you have a chance to travel to Panama, make sure you carve out time for a trip to the Bio Museum. The building was designed by world famous architect Frank Gehry and is a masterpiece unto itself with its bright colors and dramatic lines. It is the first museum in the world dedicated to biodiversity and it celebrates the prominence of Panama as one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. The content for the Bio Museum was developed by the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and it tells the story of the rise of the Isthmus of Panama and how this event changed many aspects of our world. So what exactly did we find out at the, the Bio Museum? Many millions of years ago, Panama as we know it did not exist. It is believed that more than 20 million years ago, a body of water referred to as the Central American Seaway covered the part of the earth where Panama is today, and this seaway connected the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. The oceans were not separated by a land mass as they are now, and there was no land bridge between what is now the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. So how did the Isthmus of Panama come into being? First, let's all be clear about exactly what an isthmus is. An isthmus is a narrow portion of land that connects two larger bodies of land and is also surrounded on two sides by water. Panama has the Caribbean Sea, which is part of the Atlantic Ocean, to its north and the Pacific Ocean to its south. It sits between Costa Rica to the west and Colombia to the east and is part of the landmass that joins North and South America. This is why you'll often hear it referred to as the Isthmus of Panama. It is generally thought that Panama was formed by a combination of tectonic and volcanic activity. Tectonic plates are large pieces of the Earth's solid outermost layer and these plates move and interact with each other along their boundary. The interaction of tectonic plates is responsible for a lot of different geological processes, including the formation of mountains and volcanoes, the creation of ocean basins and even earthquakes. With respect to the creation of Panama, it is believed that several million years ago, the South American and Caribbean tectonic plates of the Earth's crust slowly collided into one another. The pressure and heat caused by these collisions led to the formation of underwater volcanoes. Then, a series of volcanic eruptions began to create a chain of volcanoes in the region. Over time, volcanic activity and the deposition of volcanic materials, such as lava and ash, led to the gradual growth of these volcanoes, some of which eventually grew tall enough to break the surface of the ocean and form islands. Over the next several million years, more and more volcanic islands filled in the area. At the same time, the movement of the tectonic plates also pushed up the seafloor, helping to raise the level of the volcanoes. In addition to the tectonic and volcanic activity, strong ocean currents removed large amounts of sediment from the Americas and deposited them in the gaps between the newly forming islands. Over millions of years, the sediment deposits kept adding to these islands until the gaps were completely filled. Eventually, an isthmus formed connecting North and South America. So, you might be asking, why is this important? As we'll see, the formation of the isthmus is thought to have dramatically impacted the evolution of marine and land-based species, plant life, and even weather and ocean patterns. 
For example, the formation of the land bridge that today is Panama had a significant impact on the evolution of marine life in the region. With the completion of the isthmus, sea life in the area now had their former routes of migration between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans blocked. This led to the formation of new marine species on either side of the isthmus as species from both oceans were now isolated and had to adapt to new conditions. For example, the closure of the Central American Seaway led to the formation of a warm, shallow sea known as the Caribbean, which created a unique environment that led to the evolution of new marine species that were adapted to the warm, shallow waters of the Caribbean. It is also believed by some that the creation of the isthmus is also responsible for changes in the Earth's climate and weather pattern. Before Panama was formed, ocean currents moving north along the northern coast of South America spilled over to the Pacific Ocean through the Central American Seaway. As the isthmus of Panama was formed, the ocean currents between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans were cut off forcing water northward into the Gulf Stream current. So it is thought that one of the effects of the formation of the isthmus was the intensification of the Gulf Stream in the Atlantic Ocean. While the formation of the isthmus blocked the interaction of certain marine life, it played the opposite role with respect to land-based animals. The connection of the two continents allowed for the exchange of species as the new land bridge made it easier for animals and plants to migrate between North and South America. This migration is known as the Great American Interchange, and it involved the movement of species in both directions across the newly formed land bridge. This exchange of species had significant effects on the animal life of North and South America, leading to the extinction of some species and the diversification of others. For example, predators from North America, such as the saber-toothed cat, arrived in South America and quickly diversified into new forms taking advantage of the diverse animal prey that had not evolved defenses against them. Meanwhile, the South American ground sloth was unable to adapt to the new predators from North America and eventually went extinct. In North America today, the opossum, armadillo, and porcupine all trace back to ancestors that came across the land bridge from South America. Likewise, the ancestors of bears, cats, dogs, horses, llamas, and raccoons all made the trek south across the isthmus. Another interesting note is how Panama's volcanic beginnings impact the country today. The volcanic soil in Panama is highly fertile and contains essential nutrients such as potassium, phosphorus, and nitrogen. These nutrients support the growth of diverse vegetation including tropical rainforests and mangrove swamps. The lush forests of Panama are home to numerous plant species, including orchids, ferns, and a variety of hardwood trees. You can see many photos of these on our website, placespeoplepurpose.com. The diverse array of plant life in Panama also provides habitats and food sources for a wide range of animal species. As we've mentioned, Panama is known for its remarkable biodiversity, including a high number of bird species, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and insects. Many of these species rely on the vegetation supported by the volcanic soil for their survival. The fertile volcanic soil has also facilitated the development of Panama's agricultural sector. The nutrient-rich soil allows for the cultivation of a variety of crops such as coffee, cacao, bananas, and various fruits and vegetables. We will have a podcast focusing solely on Panama's coffee industry as Panama is renowned for its specialty coffee production. Specialty coffee refers to coffees that have exceptional quality, distinctive flavor profiles, 
and are grown in specific microclimates or regions. Panamanian specialty coffees often exhibit unique and complex flavors, including notes of citrus, floral, chocolate, and tropical fruits. These coffees are typically produced in limited quantities, making them highly prized and commanding premium prices in the global market. One of the original families for Panama's coffee industry was the Lamastis family. Their patriarch, Don Tito Lamastis, recognized the potential of Panama's fertile soils and favorable growing conditions for coffee cultivation. He acquired land in the Boquete region of Panama's Chiriqui Highlands, and that's where the family started growing coffee on their first estate. In recent years, Panama's coffee has been recognized many times on an international level for its excellence. On September 6, 2022, the Lamastis family held a private auction for coffee produced at their estate. The star of the show was some geisha coffee from their Elita Estates, which sold for a winning bid of $6,034 per pound. That's a brief introduction to Panama's coffee industry, and we'll spend more time on it with future podcasts. But I have to tell you that one of the things we always look forward to about visiting Panama is its amazing coffee. That's what we have for today. Join us tomorrow and for subsequent podcasts when we'll begin discovering the fascinating history and culture of Panama and its people. We'll learn about the original indigenous people and then the Spanish colonization of Panama in the 1500s, which supported the transportation of gold and silver from South America to Spain. We will also learn about how Panama became an independent republic and, of course, many amazing stories about the building of the Panama Canal. All of these stories will help us understand the people and culture of the Panama of today. So join us tomorrow for our next podcast of Places, People, and Purpose, where we create connections to our world.